it. The next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 15657 in the name of Rachel Hamilton on long-term decline in salmon stocks. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. Can I ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Rachel Hamilton for a second time to open the debate. Ms Hamilton, please. Thank you, presiding officer. Before I start, I'd like to uh, refer members to my register of interest as a hotel owner. I'm delighted to pre uh, present this motion to Parliament this afternoon, and I thank the presiding officer for allowing those from the Angling and Fisheries Association's time to take their waders off before they came into the gallery. Um, I'd like to also thank them for their uh, briefing notes and documents, and which has enlightened me further to the issue of long-term decline in salmon stocks. Presiding officer, we are striking scenery and richness of rivers. Scotland boasts some of the best fishing in Europe, from the fantastic beats along the Spey and the Dee with the majestic highland backdrops to the pools of the Tweed and the Tay flanked by rolling agricultural lowlands. We really are spoilt for choice in Scotland, and the value of angling to rural Scotland is significant. It supports around 2,800 jobs and contributes 100 million to the economy, with the bulk of the economic benefit being felt in remote and rural areas. Areas that otherwise would not survive without the presence of angling, game shooting, and field sports. This is illustrated by the fact that the average spend of fishing tourists on trips in Scotland is substantial at around about £5,000, with an estimated 80% of expenditure occurring locally within 12 to 15 miles of the river. Unfortunately, over many years, we've seen the success of Scottish fishing take a knock. We're all too aware of the issue of long-term decline in salmon stocks across Scottish rivers and the grave consequences many areas right across Scotland are now facing. It has caught the attention of the likes of David Attenborough, who recently marked International Year of the Salmon, by taking to YouTube to highlight the damage that intensive fish farming is having on populations of wild salmon. His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, has also voiced concerns, lamenting at the 50% reduction in salmon stocks along the River Dee. Some commentators have even gone as far to say that salmon could become an endangered species in our lifetime. On the subject of the Dee, I don't intend to discuss the pros and cons of hatcheries at this point. We can all acknowledge that there is no one single cause of the decline in salmon stocks on Scotland's river, and the picture is far more complex than we may imagine. In the latest Fishery Management Scotland's report, 12 high-level pressure pressures on Atlantic salmon were identified. These range from increased mean sea temperatures, acidification of the oceans, increased cyclicity in drought and flooding events, more invasive species and scarcer feeding opportunities. And they all play a part in the story. And importantly, we must remember most of these are driven by climate change too. We cannot forget the impact of intensive far fish farming on the West Coast either. Many believe that salmon rod catches have declined most steeply on the West Coast and have been more pronounced because of the expansion of intensive aquaculture, of which my colleague Finlay Carson will speak more. In my constituency, Tweed faces much of the same problems as other East Coast rivers, however does not have its own unique set of challenges. For years, we saw drift netting on the Northumberland coast, which affected the salmon returning to the river at Berwick. Worryingly, some 16,000 salmon were taken by northeast nets in 2015, and thankfully, the Environment Agency is proposing to stop the taking of salmon from the majority of net fisheries by 2019. Although the pisciferous birds, such as goosanders and cormorants, and predatory animals, such as seals, have also taken their toll. I will. Neil Finlay. Um, I, I haven't read the report, but I'm very interested in what she's saying. Um, can she confirm that uh, none of the reasons listed were trout anglers taking salmon? Rachel Hamilton. I thank Neil uh, Finlay for that intervention. And of course, it is important that the range of views um, are taken from across the sector and that we must take into consideration everybody. But this specific, specifically was talking about uh, drift netting. The impact of the decline of salmon fishing is being felt right across rural Scotland. Um, we know that angling is worth 24 million to the border's economy. However, it is likely to be falling as a result of decreasing rod catches. Whilst there have been behavioural changes, such as anglers switching from a week-long fishing trip to just a few days, many are commuting from larger cities 
on a daily basis and not contributing directly to the economy, whether that's in the tackle shop uh, or meals in restaurants. And the impact of the decline is likely to affect young anglers too. It's very difficult to make angling an attractive sport to the next generation when stocks are decreasing and when the potential job opportunities are being eroded by a lack of spending in the rural economy. Presiding officer, it is time that we took action uh, and, and tackle these issues head on. I welcome the Scottish Government's 700,000 of funding to be spent on work to help address the range of press pressures related to this decline. This is a start, but we need to get all stakeholders involved, scientists, anglers, gillies, all round the table to forge a way forward. The Wild, Wild Fisheries Review several, several years ago aimed to address this, and it could have been a positive step forward. However, the Wild Fisheries Bill was pulled, much to the frustration of many stakeholders involved, who believed this could help tackle the issues outlined in my motion. I recognise that the conservation of salmon regulations evolved from some of the recommendations. However, it would be beneficial if the remaining recommendations were acted on sooner rather than later. For example, a, wild, a national wild fisheries strategy. From studying previous Eclair uh, Committee sessions on the conservation of salmon regulations, it's clear we lack sufficient data and evidence to implement scientifically sound river management plans. A one-size-fits-all approach to the whole of Scotland does not work, and we need to be turning our attention to local management plans that are flexible, ones that are regularly reviewed and subject to scrutiny. I believe we also need to take a cautious, well-informed and balanced approach to the conservation and management of salmon stocks. There needs to be a fine balance between behavioural change and government regulation. And as we know, the Scottish, Gov uh, the Scottish Conservatives, we on these benches, are not uh, too much in favour of bureaucracy. On the ground, we need to look at the whole ecosystem along the entire course of the river. The effective management of predatory birds and mammals will help salmon uh, numbers recover by giving smolts perhaps the chance uh, to leave the river. We cannot ignore also the impact of fish farms in this either, and both of the parliamentary committees, the REC and the Eclair committees involved in last year's inquiry into salmon farming, made it clear that effective regulation of salmon farms in order to protect wild salmon is imperative. To conclude, presiding officer, I acknowledge there is no silver bullet when it comes to reversing the declining salmon stocks. Whilst today we have focused solely on salmon stock decline, salmon is the freshwater equi equivalent of the canary in the coal mine, an early warning system for something going wrong across the board. Healthy salmon populations are possibly one of the best indicators of healthy environment, and every one of us will benefit from a healthy environment. If we do not take action now, it's not only our fragile rural economy that will take the hit in the long term and the short term, but it's our fragile environment in the long term. Thank you, presiding officer. Thank you very much, Ms. Hamilton. I call Michelle Ballantyne to be followed by Claudia Beamish. Ms. Ballantyne, please. Thank you very much, presiding officer. And can I thank Rachel Hamilton for bringing forward this important debate. Um, at the end of the last year, I was asked if I would be the link species champion for Atlantic salmon. Um, I was delighted to take that on, um, but it has been a learning curve. I really didn't know anything about it when I set out, and what I've discovered has led to a number of worries. The Atlantic salmon is a keystone species, which means that any decline in stock has a direct and immediate impact on freshwater biodiversity, with the presence of salmon being a useful indicator of the health of our rivers. It is therefore imperative that we work to preserve wild st salmon stocks to secure the future of our, our aquatic ecosystem. And while many steps have been taken to protect salmon, exploitation in fisheries has been reduced significantly. But despite this, marine survival has decreased from a situation where around 25 adult fish return to Scotland for every 100 juveniles, smolts as they're called, leaving our rivers, to the current situation where less than five adults now return for every 100. As a consequence, as Rachel said, rod catches have reduced with a knock-on effect on a fragile rural economy, reducing the ability of managers to raise money to support management and restoration activities. But to gain a deeper understanding of the salmon's ecological importance, as well as existing conservation efforts for the species, I have visited and liaised with managing organisations such as the Neath District Salmon Fishery Board and the Tweed Forum, and have learnt about the many projects they oversee and how they hope to improve the robustness of wild salmon stocks. It is large-scale holistic projects such as the Neath Fishery Management Plan that will be invaluable to improving the stocks. 
These projects support salmon at all stages of development, from creating a safer environment for salmon spawning to removing barriers to migration. They also support improved river use with renewable energy schemes and anti-poaching measures being a key area of work. It's quite worrying when you see that 94 of 173 rivers assessed by Marine Scotland are designated as Category 3, which means that any additional pressures on salmon in these rivers is demonstrably unsustainable. Presiding officer, I'm sure we can all agree that more needs to be done to protect wild salmon and, and to encourage the growth of stocks. And I would join the call on the Scottish Government to work closely with river management organisations and salmon farmers to help with the conservation efforts and to introduce substantive measures that draw on the experience and expertise of existing local groups. In this year of the International Salmon, I was delighted to attend the conference for a short time on Friday. And it was really interesting to hear about some of the issues that have played into the system the fact that actually climate change, the warming of the seas, has meant that the food stocks for the salmon appear to have moved. The invasion of the Pacific's pink salmon was talked about, introduced into the White Sea Basin in the 1950s in Russia, but they didn't like the cold, and they've, they've moved west. And then in 2017, that we saw a huge influx of pink salmon. The initial advice was that they probably wouldn't spawn, but spawning surveillance with underwater cameras now seems to suggest that that is beginning to happen. This kind of detailed work is what we're going to need going forward, and we really need to make sure that we support the experts that are doing this in every way we can. I hope as I go forward uh, as species champion that I will learn a lot more and that I can contribute something to the debate. And in this international year of the salmon, we have an opportunity to bring the problem of declining salmon stocks into the view of the public. And I hope the Scottish Government will make bold efforts to publicise this ecological issue of national importance. The Atlantic salmon is vital to the health of our rivers and our rural economy, and we must strive to secure the future of one of Scotland's most treasured species. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Claudia Beamish to be followed by Joan McAlpine. Ms Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'd also like to thank Rachel Hamilton for instigating this debate as her motion rightly recognises the worrying decline in our salmon stocks. The motion also recognises the importance of fishing to our rural economy uh, and through leisure and tourism and the job opportunities this provides. But I do wish to highlight that what it doesn't actually stress is the importance not just for leisure and tourism from outside, which is important, but also the importance of local leisure for local people um, when they fish, not just in our big rivers, which have been mentioned already, but in burns such as in um, Strath Strath um, Strathmore up in Sutherland. And, and just give one example, uh, where I fished as a child for brown trout while my dad fished for... Um, uh, for, for salmon, but where local people are fishing, and that is really, really important. Um, and it's not just salmon, it is also sea trout and brown trout as well, and other forms of angling. So angling is vital for our economy, uh, and it has to be, for the long-term future, to be sustainable. And the system of three river gradings was established in 2016 to determine what level of exploitation of fish stocks is sustainable for each river. Um, and for this, as, as many will know, it means mandatory catch and release uh, for um, some and for others, some retention is permitted. It aims to strike the balance on rivers locally and nationally while recognising the overall downturn um, trend in salmon stocks. And this is a challenge. In 2017, 98% um, of rod caught spring salmon were released as were 90% of the annual rod catch. Our catch and release systems are the highest of any signatory to NASCO. Uh, there is clearly a commitment from the angling community, um, broad as it is, to fish responsibly, as, as much of the rod and catch, sorry, the, uh, the rod catch and, um, and return is done on a voluntary basis. Within South Scotland, I'm also aware of the pressure that the, Tweed, the River Tweed Commission put on the Scottish Government and have supported this to extend the close time on the Tweed to further protect um, fragile spring salmon stocks. And I'd like to thank um, Gilly Ian Farr, 
um, who in his brief has succinctly outlined the significance of the salmon decline on the River Tweed, and I note the points made with care. In this and the last parliamentary session, my concern has always been to ensure robust data is available to make informed choices, and I will continue to scrutinise this, along with others on our committee. Marine Scotland has consistently acknowledged this challenge, and I see the steps that are being made to improve the granularity of the science behind these assessments. And more can always be done, and I expect to see the science in this area develop and progress, but I do recognise the complexities of the issue. However, reversing the decline of salmon stocks needs to be tackled in a number of ways, not just by limiting fishing. There are environmental concerns to consider. Rivers are at a constant risk of pollution from industrial chemicals, agriculture and plastics, and fish stocks are an indication, indication of the health of our rivers and our ecosystems. And climate change is also a serious challenge. Riparian tree planting is one of the ways that this is being addressed. As Fisheries Management Scotland have highlighted, there are many ways in which we need to tackle this. And planning and SEPA must be more connected, as has been highlighted. Uh, by um, Fisheries Man Management Scotland. Uh, their briefing continues, it is vital that the conservation status of salmon is fully considered in all planning and regulatory systems. And I ask the Minister finally today to consider committing to taking forward an assessment of how joined up or not the regulation of safeguarding wild salmon and indeed sea trout is and whether, um, whether this um, can be addressed um, by the Scottish Government. So I thank Rachel Hamilton for bringing this forward um, and let's all do our best for the future of this icon iconic species, species, the salmon. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Joan McAlpine to be followed by Finlay Carson. Ms McAlpine. Thank you very much and I too would like to congratulate Rachel Hamilton on securing this very important debate which is vital to the rural economy of South Scotland. Uh, the borders which Rachel represents, um, uh, she's talked about extensively, uh, but also Dumfries and Galloway in the West. And indeed, I think it's significant that Rachel's motion raises the issue of ca catches in four East Coast rivers, the Tweed, the Spey, the Dee and the Tay, because for, for many on the West Coast, they look on enviously at those rivers and certainly a, a perception that the West um, has, has been harder hit um, and others have spoken about uh, the effect of aquaculture, which I th think we will hear more of uh, later. Um, the benefits of angling to the economy of rural, rural Scotland, as Rachel Hamilton's motion states, are significant, supporting 2,800 jobs and contributing £100 million to the Scottish economy. And I'm also grateful uh, for the briefing today um, from Ian Farr, the gilly um, at Melrose, who outlines very clearly how important salmon is to tourism uh, and what factors might explain the declining numbers and declining they are. I note the Scottish Government's own figures on the Atlantic salmon, which demonstrate a dramatic decline across the country by more than 50% from around 1.25 million in the 1960s to 600,000 in 2016. And as the government has previously pointed out, and others have pointed out today, there's no single cause for this decline. Uh, and some of the impacts are inevitably beyond our control. So it's essential that all stakeholders work together to do the, what they can to manage pressures, which includes the impacts of predation, barriers to migration, and increased temperature due to climate change. Uh, I note with uh, admiration and approval the steps which uh, Mr Farr and other river managers are taken and, and Mr Farr um, obviously in Melrose cannot make much of a dent in global temperatures himself but on his own doorstep he's working hard and he makes some interesting suggestions about the need to remove man-made barriers including obsolete ones left over from the tweed industry uh, and also um, I note with interest his observations about the increasing number of predators which he says feed on smolts, 60% of which he points out never reach the sea. Uh, he tells us that cormorants, which are seabirds, are now numerous on the Tweed and a roost in Rutherford has up to 100 birds. And he says also that seals are travelling up the river um, and goosanders are also a problem. I'm certainly not an expert in these matters, but I would be interested to know the Minister's view uh, on uh, these predators and whether research was being done uh, into this area, particularly in cormorant numbers, 
uh, which uh, I thought was very interesting and notable. Um, I know that the rivers in my own patch, the, the issue of predators and bird numbers uh, has also arisen and that was a point that was made by the chairman of the Nith River Board uh, last year. Uh, uh, angling tourism is also extremely important in South West Scotland, so I want to say a few things about the rivers there. Um, although we're talking about salmon today, I want to point out that the River Annan is considered to be the best river in Scotland for big brown trout, uh, and it's certainly worth a, a visit for, for that reason. Um, in terms of the Nith, um, they are doing a number of very important things, putting in the precautionary principle in place uh, that the government encourages in terms of the conservation of salmon. They too have seen numbers decline and um, they have promoted catch and uh, release. Uh, they maximise natural stock production by improving habitat and authorising and stocking uh, fry where appropriate. Uh, the NIF uh, conducts electrofishing as part of the Scottish Government's na national programme and something that is absolutely vital to provide data uh, members and the Minister will be aware that in many rivers in Scotland we simply don't have enough data on the numbers and the behaviour of fish and that's really important when we're classifying rivers in ways that uh, has an impact on angling. Um, it has been noted by Claudia Beamish and others that certainly uh, angling communities felt aggrieved when the rivers were classified on the basis of um, not very much information at all. Uh, so I very much welcome any increase in data gathering. Um, I note previously that- I'm the sorry, can you conclude? You're almost a minute over. I also note that the government has uh, commissioned research on the mortality rate of catch and release, and I very much look forward to hearing that when it's completed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I call Finlay Carson, who followed by Mark Ruskell. Thank you, Deputy President Officer, and I thank my colleague, Rachel Hamilton, for bringing this important debate to the Chamber today. A cultural icon is an artefact that is identified by members of a culture as representative of that, of that culture. Icons are judged by the extent to which they can be seen as an authentic proxy of that culture. Our wild salmon fit absolutely with that description, as do our rivers, up there with golden eagles, ospreys and the Scottish wildcat. Many of the recognised iconic salmon rivers are in the east, but rivers like the Bladnoch, Cree, R.D., Nith and Annan in my constituency are hugely important to contributing to the royal economy of the communities around them. Undoubtedly, greater protection and enhancement of stocks will help to maximise the socio-economic benefits that flow from them. Salmon is a protected species under the EU Habitats Directive, and yet we know that salmon continues to face many pressures in the marine and freshwater environment. Annual rod catches generally increased over the period uh, 1952 to 2010, but declining in subsequent years until 2014, the second lowest on record. The reported rod catches recovered slightly in 2015 and 2016, only to fall again in 2017. This is worrying given that the proportion of the rod catch accounted for by catch and release has generally increased since 1994. But in 2017, 90% of the annual rod catch was released compared to less than 8% in 1994. But how much that was down to external factors other than fish numbers? For example, fishing effort uh, reporting is critical for this to be robust information. However, Deputy Presiding Officer, the most important question is what, cause, what are the causes of salmon decline? Atlantic salmon faces a number of pressures during their life cycle. These include, but are not limited to, predation, poor water quality, disease and parasites, barriers to migration, poor physical habitat quality and food availability. And also fact factors affecting survival issues while at sea, including the challenges of climate change and associated warming seas. The Clare and Rural Committee also recently published a report on farm salmon and highlighted the potential issues that commercial farms may bring to the wild salmon population, including the impact of disease and parasites, including sea lice. But I'm confident that the report will result in the impact of such farms greatly being reduced over the coming years. There's also an emerging evidence that predation by cormorants and goosanders may be more important than previously thought in at least some rivers and evidence that the size and condition of smolts leaving the river may have an impact on their subsequent survival. Locally, we have fantastic volunteer groups on my rivers 
uh, like the Nith District Salmon Fisheries Board, the Cree District Salmon Board and the Galloway Fisheries Trust, working to improve water quality and removing barriers to migration, but also promoting responsible angling. And I would like to take this opportunity to invite the Minister to visit the Cree to see for herself. So, so much work, uh, good work and research has been done on our rivers. But there's also broad consensus that the main problem occurs at sea and neighbouring uh, onshore environments. And the environment, uh, marine environment, there's been huge shifts in the distribution of plankton linked to sea surface temperatures. And such ecosystem shifts are likely to have a significant impact on salmon. The International Council for the Exploration of Seas is doing work to look at the bycatch in commercial fisheries with a developing theory that mackerel and herring stocks in North Atlantic have been significantly underestimated by uh, and that the salmon are suffering from potation or competition in these areas from these species. So we need to look urgently into evidence that suggests that not only Scottish salmon stocks but also seabirds depending on plankton and small fishes uh, as their food, like kittiwakes and puffins, are plummeting. Both salmon and these seabirds are directly uh, competitors with mackerel. We need to ask the question, have northeast Atlantic mackerel stocks been allowed to develop to a point where they are a serious threat to both salmon and seabirds competing for the same food? A fully integrated scientific study to find out what's happening to the wild salmon in their journey down the river systems and out to our seas is indeed needed. Only then can we evidence uh, be based on recommendations and inform policy to enable uh, proper management solutions. The Atlantic Salmon Trust has launched the Missing Salmon Project. And no, it's I'm going sorry, can you launch on to something else now? You'll have to wind down and conclude. I certainly will. Deputy Presiding Officer, in, <laughs> in a period of just 40 years, wild Atlantic salmon numbers around the world have more than halved. The total, total population has fallen from 8 to 10 million in the early 1970s to 3 to 4 million today. Nobody knows where this mortality is happening, but I urge the government to I'm take action I'm telling you, that's now. not winding down in my book. <laughs> Just say thank you up. very much and sit down. Thank you, President. That's Officer. fine by me. <laughs> now, can I just say to the Chamber, in view of the number of members remaining to speak in today's debate, I'm minded to accept a motion under Rule 8.14.3 to extend the debate by up to 30 minutes. Can I ask Rachel Hamill to move such a motion? Moved. Are members in agreement? No members having disagreed either have extended this debate under that standing order and I now call Mark Ruskell to be followed by Neil Finlay. Mark Ruskell. Right, thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I join members in thanking Rachel Hamilton for bringing forward this debate? I've already learned a lot more about the salmon actually in the last half an hour than, than, I, than I previously knew. And um, unfortunately, I can't declare an interest um, today as a salmon angler, um, but I will declare an interest as somebody who lives just a few feet from the River Teeth one of Scotland's most iconic salmon rivers flowing into the Forth. Um, I've never fished in it, um, I've occasionally swam in it, um, but living next to the river does help me understand a little about how the pressures of climate change are affecting the health of our rivers and protected species like the salmon and also uh, the lamprey, which is protected um, through a special area of conservation on the river teeth. Now it's clear that our rivers face major challenges as water temperatures rise while water levels reduce and dramatic weather events become more frequent. A couple of years ago I saw levels on the teeth drop to their lowest for decades on what is the fastest flowing river in Scotland. Vast areas of exposed bedrock and isolated pools of increasingly warming water linked by tiny streams that were getting narrower day by day by day. Whether events like this are going to increase putting huge strain on salmon and other species that require a cooler environment and good water flow to breed and to succeed. We do need catchment-wide approaches to tackling this. For example, joining up landowners to provide better riparian environments through tree planting, Claudia Beamish has already alluded to that, that can really help to reduce the water temperatures in the rivers. And a number of, mentions, a number of members already uh, have mentioned uh, the success in, in the Tweed. You know, the Tweed management has shown uh, what is possible with a strong catchment-wide approach. And not just on salmon management, but on other issues as well, such as tackling uh, the scourge of non-native invasive species. We do need to see ways to join up that approach more in other areas too. Um, now, Scotland's Fisheries Trusts are in a position to be able to coordinate uh, a lot of the action that is needed to restore the environment in our catchments, but too often have been excluded from funding such as the uh, Scottish Rural uh, Development Funds to provide that role. 
And, and it's important that we can take that catchment approach because preventative action will always be cheaper in the long run. And we have to ensure, though, that the right incentives are there to take that action in a way that joins interests together in protecting our river catchments. Um, but it's precisely because of the pressures of climate change and a number of the other issues that members have raised in this debate that we do need to take a far more precautionary approach to the siting of salmon farms. And I make the call again that a moratorium must be put in place on expansions until, until we have the right system in place to manage the impacts of the industry on wild salmon populations. So if I could turn from the east to the west coast where bad decisions are still being made to allow vast expansions of salmon farms. Argyll and Butte Council, for example, has just allowed a huge increase in biomass production from three farms in Loch Fyne, despite major concerns about the impact on sea lice levels in wild fish. The company in question have produced an environmental management plan, which is vague and lacked proper consultation. There are also major questions about how that plan could ever be enforced by the Council who have neither the resource or the expertise to do so. Despite the central recommendation of this Parliament's report on salmon farming that the status quo is not an option, planning permissions are still being granted for expansion of farms in the wrong places that have performed very badly, badly in the past. And this is happening, whatever stakeholders like Salmon and Trout Conservation Scotland or the Fisheries Management Scotland or District Salmon Fisheries Boards and communities themselves say. And even where the track record of sea lice control on farms is very poor, as it has been in Loch Fyne. So, presiding officer, this, to conclude, this must change if we're to see one of Scotland's most iconic and legally protected species start to recover. To fail to act at a point where the salmon faces huge environmental pressures would be nothing short of a dereliction of duty. Thank you very much. I call Neil Finlay to be followed by Jamie Green, and Mr Green will be the last speaker in the open debate. Thanks, Mr. President Finlay. Officer, and, uh, can I declare an interest as a very keen fisherman with a season ticket on the Tweed, and I'll soon purchase them on the Tay and the Clyde as well. Um, I am a trout fisherman. Uh, I could also apologise that I have to leave after, uh, after I speak for another engagement. Um, I want to raise, I didn't intend speaking in this debate, but when I saw saw it on the uh, paper today, I, I, I took my opportunity. I want to raise one particular issue, and that is the uh, continuation of protect, protection orders on many of the major waters across Scotland. Um, many of these have been in existence for uh, decades, uh, since indeed prior to the formation of this parliament. 14 are in force on major water systems like the Clyde, the Tweed, the Erne, the Tay, Tummel, Spey, and other major uh, water courses. They, were supposed to be in force to protect uh, fish stocks and access to fishing. But the reality is, I remember at the time when they come on, that many trout anglers believe that the reason they were introduced was to keep trout anglers off some of these major uh, river systems and leave them free for some of the more exclusive salmon syndicates. Um, uh, I don't want to be in a position where we divide fishermen. I think fishermen are amongst, uh, wh whatever they fish for um, amongst the uh, greatest conservationists that there are but the reality is that at that time there was that division between uh, trout anglers and salmon anglers uh, uh, and as a conservation measure uh, in, in, in order to protect stocks as the example given in Rachel Hamilton's motion shows then it's been an abject failure an abject failure because we see in the motion 23,000 uh, salmon caught in 2012 uh, to 6,500 in 2017. All of that time, protection orders have been in place on the Tweed. So it has to be something else. Something else is at play. Now, whether that is climate change, whether that's the impact of salmon farming, whether that is, and I've, uh, I've seen it with my eyes, goosanders and, uh, and cormorants, I, I don't know. I don't know what it is. But there's something else at play, and it ain't fishermen that are causing the problem. That's one thing for sure. Um, if I look at a river that I fished uh, all my teenage years and later, the River Ernans, I see the tragic decline of what was a fantastic river with abundant salmon and sea trout stocks. And that decline has been in place since the protection order came on. So there definitely is something else in place. Now, uh, I have, through parliamentary questions, uh, been pursuing the Scottish Government on the continuation of protection orders. They're on and there is no end date in place, none. Um, I've asked the government to carry out 
an analysis of them to tell us whether, as a conservation uh, management uh, system, they are working. There is no uh, plan to carry out any scientific analysis of whether uh, these are successful conservation methods. Now, we're supposed to be in an era of evidence-based policy. In no other area of policy would we provide no evidence and just continue on as we are doing when it's fairly obvious that it's failing. So therefore, I would ask the minister, and I will look the official report for a reply since I won't be here, as to what the government are going to do to provide scientific evidence to justify the continuation of protection orders on these waters across Scotland. Because just to say that we will not do anything and watch the decline is not acceptable. So um, I hope the Minister will take a much more proactive uh, stance than the Cabinet Secretary ha has. And the irony of the Cabinet Secretary's position on this is that Miss Cunningham in the 80s and 90s was a young radical lawyer who represented members of the Campaign for Public Angling when they fished illegally on the Queen's Beat on the day, on the Dee and on the River Tay and people were arrested. And she defended these people, rightly in my opinion, who were deemed to be fishing illegally. And now she's the cabinet secretary responsible for continuing the system she once railed against. So I would ask the minister in her position, and I respect the minister greatly, to take a strong interest in this and look into the system of protection orders to see whether there's a justification and whether there's a conservation uh, policy they are working or not. Thanks. Thank you very much. And I call Jamie Green in to closing speech, please. Mr. Thank Green. you, Presiding Officer. Can I thank, uh, first of all, uh, Neil Finlay for his remarks. I know he has to head off, but I think that's been a very interesting contribution and I, I share his sentiment. I also should declare an interest that I too am a keen angler. I'm a member of a number of angling clubs, including the Perth and District Anglers Association and the Stormont Angling Club. Uh, you'll often find me incognito, dressed in waders and a balaclava. I'll leave that image with members to ponder. Uh, but I'm also, more importantly, uh, a member of this Parliament's Rural Economy uh, Committee, and as such, uh, with fellow members, co-offered the uh, inquiry into the aquaculture industry that we've heard so much of uh, today. I wasn't scheduled to speak in this debate, but like Mr Finlay, I take a keen interest in it. It's, it is a hobby, it is a sport, it is an industry, it is part of our rural economy. It provides me, like so many others, much needed escapism, uh, no least from politics on occasion. But I've also learned this past year that it is a valuable and indeed invaluable industry in Scotland. Let me talk somewhat about the industry itself and the people that it employs, but specifically the gillies. They're a strange breed, I have to say. I've come across many uh, over the past year since I took up angling. They are truly wonderful in the fabric of Scotland. They represent that link of the days of old and the days of new, the link between breeches and tweed and Gore-Tex and graphite. Uh, they can be grumpy, they can be fun, they can be knowledgeable. They are the keepers of our rivers, the protectors of our wildlife. They are the teachers of our young, the advocates of our countryside, the managers of our riverbanks, the guides for our tourists, and usually the owners of a kettle on a cold February morning. But most importantly, they are the eyes and ears of our rivers, and we must listen to them. Fish numbers are so low across Scottish rivers that this is a dying tradition. This could be the last generation of angling, the last generation of gillies. I sincerely hope that is not the case. But last week, just 38 salmon were caught on the tweed. 38 in a whole week. And I suspect there are beats in the tweed where they would catch that in a day in the good years. Where you used to have to wait for dead man's shoes and a waiting list for a week on a prestigious fishing beat, you can now book a day rod on your mobile phone using an app such as Demand drop. Now, that you could argue that's opened up the sport to make it more affordable and accessible. Yes, that is the case. But how do you attract new entrants when there's simply no fish to catch? How many did you catch last season? We say in the lunchtime break. Two or three is the usual the answer. What, per day? No, the whole year. It's a difficult industry, but we need to tackle some of the challenges it faces. There's no simple solution to this. But I think the first of all is the perception. The perception of what salmon fishing is. Most of the anglers I meet are retired, they're local, they're friendly, they're happy to impart their advice and knowledge 
sometimes too willing to impart that knowledge, but it is them who love their rivers and who manage them the most. This is not a sport for the rich. Yes, it is if you go to Iceland or Russia. It's a 10 grand trip, but for many, it's the 30 pounds a day, day out. Now, we've had well-rehearsed debates about salmon farming and the effect that this has had on some areas, but on the East Coast, they will say this is not the only problem. We do not know why there are such huge reductions in salmon, and perhaps therein lies the problem. Not enough scientific research has gone into this. Predation certainly is an issue. I've seen, like Mr. Finlay, uh, cormorants and goosanders feeding on fish. I've seen seals so far up the river, I wonder what on earth they're doing there. Why are they feeding there? Why are salmon going further out to sea and heading in different directions? Where are their feet heading? Why are the riverbeds changing? Why have we not dealt with the damage that floods and storms and years in some rivers of a lack of management or underinvestment has achieved? Why have we not righted the wrongs of the industrial area, era on our rivers? But we as policymakers, in closing, need to have a frank discussion about some of these areas. Catch and release is the main one. But also, I think, we need to have a conversation at some point about Sunday fishing, because tradition is one thing, but we are on the brink of having no industry at all. I think we need to have a healthy and open debate. Change is often unwelcome, but perhaps it is inevitable. In closing, let me thank Rachel Hamilton for this debate. I remain positive, but if action is not taken, then I'm afraid the only thing we will be fishing for in future is sympathy. Thank you very much. And I call on Marie Goujon to close the government. Minister, please, approximately seven minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I really want to begin today by thanking Rachel Hamilton for bringing this vitally important issue to the Chamber today. And I think it is a bit of a shame while we've had a lot of speakers that we don't have more people in the Chamber to hear it. Because, uh, as Mark Ruskell said, you know, he's learned more in this past half hour than I have in the past while about salmon. Uh, it's one thing that I just I've found absolutely fascinating. I mean, I don't have direct portfolio, portfolio responsibility for it, um, but it is an issue uh, I have been involved in. And uh, again, it is absolutely fascinating. But I think that Michelle Ballantyne and a few others touched on a vitally important point today. Um, about the fact that salmon is a, a keystone species and it's about what the decline in numbers means for our wider biodiversity and as Claudia Beamish stated in her, uh, her speech as well it indicates the health of our rivers and our ecosystems so while this may be considered a rural issue and again we don't have that many people in the chamber today it is so vitally important as to what that means for our wider ecosystems and biodiversities. Uh, yes. Edward Mountain. I thank the Minister for giving way and I refer members to my register of interest. One of the most important threats to salmon and, and species in rivers is the invasion of non-native and native species out with their ecosystem. Will the Minister give the uh, Chamber today an undertaking that this government will work proactively to control species like such as ranunculus in rivers where they're choking the very fish that she's talking about today? Minister. Thank you. I'd be happy to look at that. And that was also going to be a point that I was um, going to come back to that Mark Ruskell raised as well later on in my contribution. I, but really, I mean, obviously, salmon is one of Scotland's most iconic species. Uh, and sadly, as we've heard today, fewer and fewer of the fish that leave our rivers for the ocean are returning. Now, the International Council for the Exploration of the Sea estimates that around uh, 1.25 million salmon return to Scottish waters each year in the 1960s. But by the end of 2016, as we heard from Joan McAlpine, this figure was down to just 600,000. And this pattern is replicated right across the North Atlantic, with ICES estimating the overall numbers, which were previously around 8 to 10 million in the 1980s, now down to just 3 million. Now, numbers are in decline, and again, as we've heard today, there are a whole variety of reasons for that. In Scotland, we've worked with the Fisheries Management Scotland and its member district salmon fishery boards and trusts to identify the 12 high-level pressures on salmon, some of which Rachel Hamilton, Finlay Carson and others outlined today. And we've published a list of those pressures online. And, uh, and today I want to outline some of those and the key activities that we're currently undertaking to try and mitigate against some of those. Now, one such pressure is from exploitation through angling and netting in our rivers and around the coasts. Over the past few years, we've introduced a range of new measures to help conserve and protect salmon in rivers. Changes to the annual close times on most rivers, for example, extended the period during which it's illegal to fish for salmon or to keep those that you've caught. 
Annual salmon conservation regulations set out the results of our annual assessment of stocks and detail those rivers where anglers must practice catch and release fishing. Uh, yes. Lee Carson. Thanks for taking the intervention. Would, would, would the Minister agree that, given the, the recent evidence at the Eclair Committee, that actually angling effort could potentially be insignificant compared to other, other uh, pressures in salmon fishing? Minister. I think we have to consider all the, the, all the measures. I mean, but as I understand, that was just the point I was waiting to come on to, the discussion that took place at the Environment Committee, because I believe, I believe that the 2019 regulations were considered and passed on the, the 12th of March. And I, I believe Claudia Beamish had noted the significant improvements in the assessment approach this year. But I mean, we have to consider all these in the round and make sure that we do the research into each of the, the individual pressures too. Now, we're continuing to develop and improve on our annual adult assessment. And last year, we introduced a Scotland-wide assessment of juvenile stocks, which we hope will complement and improve the existing science. But angling is just one part of the picture because research in this area is vitally important, as I've just stated. Last March, we announced a package of £500,000 to be invested across a range of research and practical projects, which are helping us to examine and address the wider pressures on salmon. On predation, for example, we're work working with the Sea Mammal Research Unit to analyse the behaviour and movement of seals in the River Dee. Later this year, Marine Scotland will publish the results of research carried out with the Ness District Salmon Fishery Board and Aberdeen University to identify the impact of dolphin predation on returning adult salmon in the Moray Firth. And I'm happy to confirm to Joan McAlpine that we've recently commissioned new research to analyse the feeding habits of fish predating birds to identify where and when they're feeding and what they're eating. And that's a, po a point again which had been raised and a point of concern raised by others throughout the debate today. I know the impact of such birds has been of concern to Rachel Hamilton in particular in the past and to many anglers and fisheries managers. Now on barriers, SEPA is working with local authorities, landowners, fishery trusts and conservation bodies to deliver an annual programme of projects to remove and ease barriers to migrating fish. There's a recent example of this from West Lothian where since January of this year, water is now flowing down a new bypass channel uh, around the redundant rugby club weir. This is the third of seven weirs being tackled by 2021 to restore fish access into the River Almond catchment. The project is opening up around 200 kilometres of river network to native fish, including salmon, for the first time in generations. And that also creates new opportunities for angling, tourism and recreation. Uh, I recently visited the S District Salmon Fishery Board in Brechin to hear about some of the work that they do. And they took me to the site of the Pow Burn project, uh, which was essentially about their working together with SEPA and changing the morphology um, of the, the Pow Burn and really looking at the impact that that had made, where they were actually starting to see trout return to that part of the river where there hadn't been any for a number of years. And they also explained to me, and I heard about their work in relation to catchment wide approaches that Mark Ruskell uh, mentioned because that is so vitally important where they talked about the, the tree planting that was happening further up the glens and also the work that was happening around the Esk rivers in relation to inv uh, invasive non-native species. On habitat improvement, fishery boards are working with SEPA to address acidification and reduce diffuse pollution. Scottish Water is working to improve abstraction regimes in nine zones to ensure that there's sufficient water remaining in our rivers and lochs during periods of low rainfall. But there are also pressures associated with our salmon farming industry. And I realise that that was uh, another point raised by a number of members today uh, and the concerns around that. Now, we've responded to the recent REC committee report on salmon farming and identified links to many of our current initiatives, including the Farmed Fish Health Framework, the Interactions Working Group and SEPA's Sector Plan. During the report debate on the 6th of February, there was broad cross-chamber support for the sector, but with an emphasis that progress has to be made on the known issues. We agree with that and have acknowledged that salmon farming must be developed sustainably with appropriate improvements that help to minimise and address environmental impacts. But these pressures don't just affect salmon in our rivers. 
as the ISIS figures show, the issues go much wider and the loss of so many fish in the marine environment is also of great concern. That's why it is so important that we also work with partners across the world. Marine Scotland is taking part in Sea Sailor, a research programme conducted by an expert international consortium which is examining the factors impacting the variation in marine survival of Atlantic salmon over time and in different geographical areas. More widely, this is the International Year of the Salmon, an initiative being led by the North Atlantic Salmon Conservation Organization and the North Pacific An Anadromous Fish Commission. And Michelle Ballantyne, I realize, also had a motion relating to this. Uh, and I, I didn't realize at the time she was also the species champion for, for the salmon. But I would say there was also a lot in her motion that we, that we agreed with. Now, the International Year of the Salmon aims to raise awareness and understanding of the social and economic benefits that salmon provide and to highlight the many issues facing salmon around the world. Rosanna Cunningham launched the Scottish component of that last October when she met the presidents of both NASCO and the Commission in Perth. And officials from Marine Scotland were among a range of international speakers contribu contributing to last Friday's annual meeting of Fisheries Management Scotland. There are just a couple of points I want to make before we close, pres pres presiding officer. I realise I've probably gone way over time, but I just want to say I absolutely recognise the importance of angling to the Scottish economy, again, outlined by uh, many members today. There were a number of points that I wanted to raise. Claudia Beamish raised the point of regulation in a joined up approach. Certainly consider that where we do that. I think it works in the most effective way to work. Um, Finlay Carson's invite, I'm more than happy to accept that and to dis discuss some of the issues that you raise further. Neil Finlay raised particular points he wanted us to address and again I, I, I'm happy to, to look at that too. Um, I realise that there are a number of pressures as we've identified today but we are undertaking the research to try and mitigate those as best as we can and we need to work together so that we're able to do that and we don't end up in the situation that Jamie Green outlined in the fears where angling becomes a thing of the past. We certainly don't want to see that happen. Thank you. Thank you very much. My efforts to curtail things are in vain, frankly. Can I thank all members for a very interesting and informed debate? And yes, I wish more people had heard it. It was extremely interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, I conclude the debate and I suspend this meeting of Parliament till 2.30.